I'm going to go ahead and get started. So anyway, so real quick, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands again. Who has seen this panel before? OK, all right, enough people that my jokes are going to land. Awesome. <laughs> um, those of you who have seen this panel before, was it at Kineticon or MAGFest? MAGFest, OK. Did anybody see it anywhere other than Kineticon and MAGFest? OK, you guys, I, I love you guys, but yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> that was a stupid question. All right, cool. So good to know. Um, I like to just tell people that there have been updates, um, especially since MAGFest 2020, um, because that was my last in-person panel before the world ended. So I think about those panels a lot, actually. So I'm glad to be back. Um, but a lot has changed in Pokemon, and a lot has changed in this panel. And hopefully, a lot has changed in your memory of my panel, so the stuff that stayed the same, you're going to enjoy anyway. Uh, <laughs> all right, and also, can everybody in the back hear? Great, okay, and then I will keep my voice at this volume. Awesome. So, welcome to Pokebiology 102. Um, you might ask yourself, where's 101? I kept updating the presentation, so it was kind of like a ship of Theseus situation, so I named it 102. Um, you're going to learn a little bit about real life biology, as well as some speculative Pokemon biology. Um, one of the things that we're going to um, talk about here is that Pokemon was not designed by biologists. Um, the Pokedex was written by 10 year olds, technically. Um, it, it's gotten a little bit better uh, in modern times, but ultimately we need to take it at face value. So please don't get mad at me that they're not, you know, respecting the laws of physics, because they don't. <laughs> I'm just going to put that out there right now. Um, but there's a lot we can learn from Pokemon. Um, there's a lot we can learn from video games and thinking about science and biology in different terms. So especially in Pokemon, there are themes of ecology, physiology, evolution, and genetics. These are all in the Pokedex. These are all in kind of like supplemental materials. I'm going to try to keep it to the games. Um, the anime gets weird. Um, but either way, <laughs> it gets real weird. Um, but either way, these are some of the core themes that we're going to see moving through the Pokemon franchise. If you're just coming in, there are tons of empty seats. Uh, go ahead, raise your hand one last time. Lots of empty seats. Come make friends. Lots of empty seats. And we're going to learn about these things. And if you're sitting in this panel and you're like, I did not sign up for this. I was in the arcade until 3 AM. Oh my god. I will not be offended if you take a nap. <laughs> so, all right. So let's start talking about biology as, a, as an academic field, right? So biology is the study of life. Um, and we have a few qualifications to define what is alive. Um, this is especially important when we're trying to like set the field of play, right? Set some expectations. So we have seven qualifications, and the first is a basic unit of function. So for the sake of argument, we're going to assume that all Pokemon have cells. Um, cells are a basic unit of function. Right? Okay, we're good. Uh, so all Pokemon have cells, for, or are cells, in the terms of like solosis and that entire evolutionary line. So that's, that's our first argument here. The second rule is that structure relates to function. If you're just coming in, go ahead, find an empty seat. Um, raise your hands again. I know I told you it was the last time, but people keep walking in. <laughs> come on in, come on in. All right, we're going to pause for 30 more seconds so these fine people can find a seat. Uh, raised hands means there are empty seats. All righty. Cool. Raised hands equals empty seat. Awesome. All right, so structure relating to function. So Caterpie, Caterpie can move all around. That's because his feet have ridges on the bottom, like a gecko, which extends the surface area and allowed these things called Van der Waals forces to take effect. So once again, I rarely talk about the anime, but Misty, the whole episode where Misty is scared of bugs and Caterpie just wants to be friends with her and is like walking upside down on like various surfaces, scaring the crap out of Misty, right? Um, that's because his feet are built to do that. We also have things like the continuity of life. Pokemon does not define <laughs> continuity. Um, you just drop, drop your kiddos off at the daycare and then suddenly you have an egg. Um, but uh, needless to say, life finds a way, life goes on. Um, we have use of energy. So it does not matter if that energy is purposeful. 
Um, it doesn't matter if that energy is helpful. Magikarp using Splash is still mar Magikarp expending energy to do something, which makes sense because Splash has PP, right? So, you know, it doesn't have to be productive. Um, we also have growth. So in the Pokemon games starting in Gen 3, they started talking about the sizes of Pokemon that you catch. So for the Shroomish, there was actually a cabin that you could go to and like be like, this is the Shroomish I found. Um, I believe there was one for fish as well, but my brain cannot remember it to, to save my life. What was that, Matt? Magikarp at the Lake of Rage. Magikarp at the Lake of Rage, so that's Gen 2. <laughs> yes, okay, so starting in Gen 2, technically. Um, we see this in Pokemon Go as well, right? Like, you can catch smalls, mediums, and larges, and extra larges, um, like the Pumpkaboo challenges. Um, so we do see that Pokemon grow. Pokemon also respond to their environment. Um, the newest generation of games is really, really good at this because if you're walking around, you can actually see them living in their space. Um, in Arceus, that can mean anything from just grazing in a field to looking at you with scary red eyes and chasing you down. <laughs> um, and Pokemon adapt and evolve. That's kind of part of the core ideas of the series is that you evolve as a Pokemon, you evolve as a trainer, um, good happy feelings there. Um, we'll get to this at the end of the presentation. Um, we'll talk about this more, but we do see this as a core idea in the Pokemon universe. So let's just do like a couple case studies. Um, I pick on Trubbish, but I love him. <laughs> but you know, there are some people, and there might be people in here that complain, right? Like how is a, that's a sentient bag of trash. How is that alive? Um, people ask all the time, what's up with Vol Voltorb, right? What's up with Magnemite? Well, let's, let's take a look, right? So for the sake of argument, there's a basic unit of function. Excuse me, soda, okay. So for the sake of argument, there's a basic unit of function, so they both have cells, we've established that. Their structure relates to their function. So Trubbish in the Pokedex, their garbage bag handles are actually antennae that sends signals to Trubbish to tell them what's going around in their environment, right? What's going on? For Voltorb, those of you who are schooled in electricity, electricians, electrical engineers, people who like to just kind of like fiddle around um, and make things, you know that red and white have specific meanings for charges in electricity. Anyone who's jumped a car knows red and black, right? There's a positive, there's a negative. So Voltorb, as an electric type Pokemon, is going to store those charges in those sides of their bodies. Now looking at Legends Arceus and how they started off as a grass type, that's really interesting. Um, there's a lot to be talked about there. Um, but there is a function there. There is the continuity of life. Both of these Pokemon have egg groups. You can drop them off at the daycare and get a new little Pokemon. Um, they both use energy. Uh, this seems pretty obvious in Voltorb's case. They both grow, they both have sizes. I'm really depending on like the newer generations for that and Pokemon Go. They both respond to their environment. I mean, if you're playing the newer games, they're gonna jump out at you, right? And they both adapt and evolve. They have evolutionary um, lines as well as they learn new moves, right? So that could also be considered adaptation and evolution. So now that we kind of have seen this in like Pokemon terms, let's take a look at some like real world applications of this. So I'm saying that our basic unit of function is a cell. Depending on what version of biology you're talking about, we could look at smaller things, right? So we have things like molecules, atoms, we have tissues, we have organs. These are both larger and smaller than a cell but they're still like the basic building block that you could talk about in terms of biology. Um, and structure relates to function. So I once had an organic chemistry teacher ask a really good question. What would you rather hit someone with, a pool noodle or a printer? And honestly, yes, the, the question is it depends. Um, <laughs> but for the sake of argument, what's easier to hit someone with, a pool noodle or a printer? Pool noodle. Yes, we all agree, okay. What would you rather hit someone with? Printer. A printer. Okay, both have two separate functions, right? But it's easier with the pool noodle. Pool noodles are for smacking, printers are for throwing overhead. Okay, glad we could talk about this in a good way. 
Um, in the Midwest, by the way, if I just ask, what would you rather hit someone with? They say pool noodle. On the East Coast, it's a printer. So <laughs> things, things I have noticed. Um, <laughs> so there's a, the continuity of life. Um, life finds a way. So we have something called the central dogma in biology, where we talk about DNA to RNA to protein. So your DNA that's in the nucleus of a cell gets translated to RNA, mm. right? Yes. And then it gets built into a protein. So essentially everything in your body that is built out of proteins is defined in your DNA in some way. I know, I'm missing some subtleties. I see some people getting mad. You can yell at me later. <laughs> All right. And ev all of this uses energy. So in the real world, we talk about things like cellular respiration and photosynthesis. Um, your cells are always on fire. Um, your cells are always doing something. Your body is always doing something. Even when you're asleep, you're using energy. Um, there's growth. So the easiest thing to think about is cell division, mitosis. Um, you can think about the way that your bodies build tissue. We all went from being babies to full-grown adults, right? We grew somehow. Um, and all of that ties into that use of energy as well. We respond to our environment. Um, right now you're listening to me or you're thinking about the dealer's room or you're thinking about going back to the arcade. That's okay. Um, so you're responding to your environment in some way, right? Um, your body is responding to the environment in a highly more complex manner. You have your cells telling you how you're sitting where you are in space in relation to the ground, your brain is processing information. Um, so actually you're doing a lot more than you think you are right now, go you. And adaptation and evolution is kind of the result of all of this change. It's a result of using energy, building tissue, learning new things. Um, so that's kind of our real world application of life. So I just talked at you a lot <laughs> and we are 10 minutes into this. Um, but there are subcategories and subcategories and subcategories of biology. Um, you can talk about anything from relationships in the environment to clinical applications to things that are really small like biochemistry and all of these other fun fields. Oh, yeah, there we go. I knew I forgot one last one. So it is to say that one person can know an approximate knowledge of all of these. Um, it's really hard for one person to be an expert in all of these fields due to all the details. Um, so that's why I'm like, I'm going to give you an overall view. Um, I am an ex-marine biologist turned biomedical engineer, so I have some approximate knowledge of all of this. It's rusty. So if I say something that's not accurate and you need to come tell me, please do. Um, go ahead and tell me after the fact. Um, but remember that science is a team sport as well. Um, and we also have things like chemistry that comes into this and physics and other, yeah, um, and other fields that all tie into this. So remember I said Pokemon break the laws of physics? Physics people will get mad at me too. It's great. Everyone's going to get mad at me. I love it. Um, but that is to say in the Pokemon world, this is also reflected in our professors. Professors all have different specialties that they dedicate their academic lives to studying, right? Um, so pokebiology is really the study of Pokemon life. Um, and you have professors with projects and assistants. Um, I finally made it out of grad school kicking and screaming. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. I was one of them COVID graduates, um, but I did it. Um, and I was one of those professors' assistants, right? Um, and in the Pokemon games, you become the professor's assistant, which is really important because it lets you go do what you want while also kind of understanding more about Pokemon. Scarlet and Violet gets a little shaky, but we'll, we'll ignore that. So pokebiology, we have the early professors that are really looking at relationships, habitats, evolution, and things like archeology, span origins of life, paleontology. That's kind of like a side branch. Um, I like to adopt them into the biology sphere. Um, you also have things like studying the continuity of life, um, like acute abilities, as well as your attacks, like instruction and function relationships. Um, I always say that I probably would have been in Professor Kukui's lab, not just because, you know, who doesn't want to go to grad school on a tropical island, but also I'm a physiologist. So that's where I would have landed. So those of you who are like, I haven't played a Pokemon game since 2002, are sitting here like, who are all these new people? That's okay. 
this was our original like send out, right? Oak wanted us to create the Pokedex. And that is where we are going to start with ecology. <laughs> because the original games were really focused on documenting all of the Pokemon in the world and where they were living. And ecology is the study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. So essentially, what lives where and why? How many are there? And how do they live? So how many Lapras are in the sea? Why are they in the sea? Well, they're sea turtles, kind of. <laughs> they're really fun looking sea turtles, right? I mean, how many Golem are in a cave? Why are they living in a cave? They're rocks. There you go, done. <laughs> Komalas, how many Komalas are there? Why are they living in trees? They sleep 22 hours a day and they can only eat certain plants, much like actual koalas. Um, so, you know, some quick and easy answers, but we know all this because of previous exploration, right? So starting with what lives where and why, um, we're going to talk about biomes. So biomes are zones determined by the vegetation type or physical environment. Once again, I'm going to talk about the newer games um, because they did a great job. I think Alola especially did a great job in exploring the differences, mostly because the technology did get better. We were able to have better rendered environments for the Pokemon to live in, um, but also they started taking the idea that Pokemon live all over the world. What does that look like? Um, and that was really cool to explore, I think. Um, Scarlet and Violet also did a really good job with that. You had everything from canyons to mountains to, we couldn't dive, but there was still a really rich, like, marine area. Um, I, myself, had done, like, I just swam around <laughs> the entirety of fake Spain, um, just because just I could. Um, but they did actually, Game Freak really embraced the idea that Pokemon live in different places. Um, we do have, we, we can, they don't stick to rules about what can live in freshwater versus saltwater versus brackish water, um, but we do kind of see it, right? Um, I like to think that in the earlier Pokemon games that uh, darker blue, that's saltwater, and anything lighter blue, that's like freshwater, and you do have things that can live in both. Once again, you think of things like salmon, you think of things like eels, things that swim up creeks, swim down creeks, and then go do mysterious things in the middle of the ocean, right? Um, those exist, but Pokemon doesn't seem to even have a rule for that. <laughs> so once again, grain of salt, right? We also have man-made environments, and these are things that could be anything from the bottom of a bridge, right? Those of you who have been able to take boats out like, you know, a river or a creek out into the bay, you know that there are shellfish living under those bridges. You know that tiny fish like to live in secluded spots so they don't get eaten, right? Younger fish, nurseries, they like marshes and other secluded spots. Bridges are really, really good for that. Um, when it comes to things like the abandoned electric plant, <laughs> Um, that, that gets a little uh, sketchy once again, but one, you can kind of understand that electric Pokemon, if they're dealing with electric currents, that's probably a safe place for them to be. So that's where they're going to want to be. All right, so some more definitions here. We have communities. So those are different populations of species living close enough to interact. We have this definition in a lot of other places in our lives too. It doesn't necessarily change in biology. Um, th this is more, the manga and the anime do more for like community depictions. <laughs> um, I think the newer games show it really well too. But once again, if you look at the Pokemon Adventures manga, they go into more of that kind of like ecology, community observation. Uh, population is a group of single species living in the same area. So that could be like your mega spawns in Arceus. I don't remember exactly what they're called, but they all just pop up at once. Ooh, that's weird. Um, no, it's just a population, probably just you noticed it. Um, I ended up talking about koalas a couple talks back. So kamalas, they're gonna live where they're gonna live. There's gonna be a population of kamalas at the plants that they eat, because kamalas only eat certain types of plants that are actually toxic to them. They've built up a resistance. Um, much similar to actual koalas that live in eucalyptus forests, because they eat eucalyptus, which is toxic. <laughs> um, learning about that kind of blew my mind a little bit, but it was neat that Game Freak thought to include that um, in their games. 
So how many are there? So if you talk to different biologists with different ecological perspectives, there are different ways to catch them all or count them all. Um, my personal history is in population studies and diversity studies using marine biology. So depending on what we were doing, we would actually take this little square and throw it behind our heads <laughs> and count what was other, whatever was in the square. Um, from what I understand in the prairies, this is really good for grasslands because you can kind of just like pick a square foot <laughs> instead of trying to determine randomly where to look in a prairie for what you're looking for. Um, I would also do uh, unbaited traps. So we'd go out into the marina, we'd pull up the trap, we see what's inside. We did not bait them because we didn't want to skew our data or bias our data. Um, there are other ways of doing this as well. So my co-panelist couldn't be here today. Um, her name is Natalia Moss. Uh, she works for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and she does bird banding. Um, so she goes out, they take nets, they look at what birds are flying through the area, which is really important in migratory seasons. So especially in the Midwest, they're looking at light pollution, they're looking to see um, how birds traverse through cities. So those of you who have heard about Chicago's problems this past spring, it was really, really tragic because birds just hit sky skyscrapers. Um, so it's really important to know how many birds are moving through and what they're doing because that helps you know, endangered species. And in general, the population of even unendangered un species, not endangered. Good morning. Still morning on my computer. All right, so it's easy in theory. You're just counting things, but it's really, really important. Because um, one of the other things that we want to talk about is invasive species. So yes, boo. <laughs> So it is a species that has expanded from its natural habitat. And actually, you guys on the East Coast are probably really, really, really uh, familiar with this uh, concept, because land, spotted lanternflies, yes. Um, boo, yes. Yes, boo, good. I'm, unfortunately, I'm now teaching Midwestern people about it, because one was spotted in Cook County two months ago. Um, and oh my goodness, my PSA in Kansas City was like, snap smash. <laughs> Take a photo, send it to the Department of Natural Resources, squish it. Um, so they're getting there. Um, so I do have our, I have them up here, you, you already know. Um, the plant over there is Japanese honeysuckle. It was brought over because it looked pretty. Um, so a lot of the Colonists, pioneers, uh, rich white people brought it in to their gardens because they thought it was nice, and it's taken over um, everywhere. Oh, I thought I had a third one. I usually talk about also the Asian shore crabs as well as green crabs because they were brought over in the ballast water of uh, ships, and they've been around ever since the 80s. Well, Asian shore crabs have been around since the 80s, and it took a while for birds to know that they could eat them Luckily, that's starting to pan out. Um, birds are recognizing them as prey, as well as people are eating them. So they are edible. So if you ever do see Asian shore crab on a menu, know that it's invasive and start chowing down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have these in Pokemon too. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to stay on my invasive species soapbox for long because you're all ready to like kill spotted lanternflies. Um, awesome. Um, so invasive species in the Pokemon world do exist. Um, we see them in Alola with the Rattata and the Young Goose. Um, so this is the Rattata were originally introduced off of Kanto ships. They overpopulated the island and then they brought in Young Goose to solve the problem. Um, the issue with this is you brought one species in maybe by accident and then you brought purposely another species in by accident but now there is an established population on your island. This is a real life parallel to Macquarie Island um, in Australia. So Australian colonists went in on this island, they brought rabbits. What do rabbits do? They breed, you get lots of little bunnies, right? The rabbits took over the island, decimated all of the vegetation, and they were like, oh, this is bad because the birds are gone. So they brought in cats to take care of the bunnies. <laughs> um, and now cats are running that island. Um, they have removed the cats and guess what they brought back in again? Bunnies. So, you know, we don't learn. <laughs> but it was interesting to see Game Freak really kind of like come in and recognize that that's a parallel that they could display in their games to talk about. 
And just so you're aware, maybe not so much anymore. This is a really old slide, as you can see by the 2016 on the bottom there. But if you're looking for a quick and easy activity to teach folks about ecology and kind of tracking what's in your area, Pokemon Go is still a really good tool to do so. Um, I don't think you can do like weeks at a time anymore. I think if you're a librarian and you're looking for like an afternoon activity, looking into how we document ecology, how we do population studies and diversity studies, and using the app that's probably already on a lot of phones already, that's a really powerful tool. So like, go try it at home. Maybe not here, because the service is starting to wane, but like, you know, go try it at home. All right, so quick recap. We talked about ecology, we talked about biomes, and invasive species, you're all like pros at that, thank you. Um, we talked about communities and how most species are adapted to their specific environment. There's a reason they live where they live. So now that we've gotten through that, let's talk about how they're living. So how are they interacting? Is it positive or negative? That's going to depend, right? It's going to depend on the species. It's going to depend on what their goal is. Um, so here um, you see Turtwig and Zangus. No, Linen, sorry, it was the arrow. Um, Linen and Turtwig, they're getting along. There's no like competition there. Those of you with dogs or cats that may eat out of each other's food bowl, know that there's a little bit of negative interaction there, right? Um, but there's, they seem to be getting along. Invasive species, it really depends on the situation once again. So crabs, they're gonna fight, but they're also gonna get their own niche and it, it won't be too negative or it's something like the spotted, spotted lanternfly, which is going to find trees and kill them. That's, that's pretty negative. Um, adaptation, we see this more in the anime and the manga, and like things like Pokemon Concierge was really cute to see how Pokemon wanted to live. Um, so far-fetched, building nests out of leaks. That's, that's something we saw in the manga. Um, that's really the development of unique characteristics or behaviors. So that's like a short-term thing. So types of interactions, once again, can be positive or negative. Predation, depending on who you are in the situation, this is a positive. Depending on who you are in the situation, it's a negative. Um, Caterpie is having a negative interaction here. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't look too happy. Um, however, Pidgeot looks thrilled that it found dinner. Um, competition, once again, this can go either way. You compete for space, you compete for food, you can compete for attention, you can compete for mates, uh, things like that. You also have things like symbiosis. Now I know technically, <laughs> I can hear it, I can hear it. I saw the exclamation points. Technically this is parasitism, right? Technically, because he's sucking the life out of slow poke technically it's a slow bro but it's just a really beefy slow poke now um but the slow poke slash slow bro no longer has a headache because of the toxin so technically <laughs> so once again we can argue about this all day um but you have these relationships where maybe someone's helping someone else right um more examples of these adaptations um, we have Chinchu. They live at the bottom of the ocean. Is the bottom of the ocean dark? Heck yeah, it is. Can we see where we're going? Can we see our friends? Probably not, unless you have fun bioluminescent antennae. Um, Macargo is hilarious when you read the Pokemon uh, Pokedex entry, because apparently volcanoes are 2,500 degrees Celsius. And that's where Macargo lives, which if I remember correctly, in Ruby and Sapphire, we walk through those volcanoes. <laughs> and I don't, um, yeah, I'm just gonna leave that there. Um, but Macargo keeps its body temperature hot. It lives in a volcano. It doesn't wanna overheat. So its body is actually physically adapting to its environment, so it doesn't burn to a crisp. Um, although I guess it is burning, but it's meant to, it's fine. We talked about Caterpie at the start of the panel. It has ridges on the bottom of its feet. Those ridges expand to the surface area, and those surface areas have van der Waals interactions that just adhere, lightly adhere, but adhere. We also have a pretty straight parallel here. We do have um, Kangaskhan. We have our, our marsupial Pokemon, just like we do in real life. That's an adaptation to make sure that their young get 
to the wild safely, right? Their young need to stay in their pouch because they're not fully developed and the parents can protect them. We also have the um, variants, so Rattata. So we have the Alolan Rattata and the Canto Rattata. Both look different because they live in different places and have very different needs for their camouflage. So I always like to think that Canto Rattata kind of looks like an Ekans. And if you're a really hungry pharaoh and you don't want to pick up a snake, but you want to pick up a rat and you see something purple in the grass, there's like a 50-50 shot and you might not take that shot, right? So it's mimicry in that way. Whereas uh, Alolan Rattata is more camouflage to stay out in the dark. So its belly is light, its back is dark, right? So once again, if you're flying overhead looking for a Rattata, you might not see it. Um, this big boy, I love him. <laughs> He is great. Like props, props to that character designer. Honestly, I love him. So these are actually, the executors are two different types of palms. So uh, Alolan executor is a tropical palm tree, whereas the Kanto executor is a brush palm. And brush palms are more like, let's spread out. We're not competing for sunlight. Like I can just find my space over here and get the light I need to photosynthesize. Whereas Alolan executor live on tiny little islands they might not have that luxury, right? So they have to be the tallest to get the most food. Make sense? Yeah? Yay! Um, and then they just went off, man. This isn't even... <laughs> Wiglet, he, it's not... Re like, I just think he's neat, okay? Um, I, I really just think he's neat. Um, so he is a grass eel. Grass eels embed themselves in the sand, and they kind of just wiggle and catch what's coming by in the current. Um, the wiglet in Scarlet and Violet obviously is not accurate to a grass eel because they are on the beach. Um, but once I saw this little guy, I like lost my mind. Um, <laughs> I love him. He's great. And technically not related to wiglet or diglets because they're two separate Pokemon. Um, we can call this convergent evolution if you want. We'll talk about that later. Um, but I don't know. Like I said, I just think he's neat. Uh, we also have some Pokemon that adapt as fungi. So we have Shroomish. Um, they look like little Pokeballs, so they don't get stepped on. So maybe, you know, you look, you're like, ooh, item, right? And then you pick up a Shroomish. That was more in the hmm? fungus, fungus. Oh my gosh, thank you. Not Shroomish, thank you. It's still morning on my computer, okay? I only had half of a Mountain Dew. Um, all right, so yes, so we do have Fungus. So, ooh, look, an item. In the early games, they actually did look like an item, and it was really annoying. In the newer games, they're just so small you can't see them, <laughs> and you step on them, and then you're in an, in an encounter, and you're like, dang it. Um, when it comes to things like Paris and Parasect, um, they look like they're a mushroom, and you're like, oh, photosynthesis. Actually, this is parasitism. This is straight up cordyceps. Um, those of you who have played Last of Us, um, this is Cordyceps. It's in your Pokemon too. Um, there's no, there's no Pedro Pascal here, but um, you know, it's it's a great time. Paris and Parasect, um, especially if you're playing Legends Arceus and you found that one before you were before you were leveled to take him on. Terrifying, right? Zombie movie. Um, and I included. Um, I include Flamigo. He's not an adaptation. He's just straight up a flamingo. I'm still not entirely sure um, why they put him in there because he's really just mad. Um, he's just, you know, they didn't want to put a Canada goose in there, so they put a really mad flamingo. Um, once again, I just think he's neat. Um, so with that, how do Pokemon really work? Is this why you're here? How many people are here because they just want to know how Pokemon work? The you sat through the ecology, here is your prize. We're gonna start talking about the, the, the cool stuff in my wheelhouse, which is physiology. Once again, quick reminder, this is for fun. We're learning a lot, right? How many people have learned something today? Raise your hand, yay, good. I'm learning that I'm not awake yet. Um, <laughs> so once again, not designed by biologists, take it at face value. So we're gonna go back to the cell. Um, the cell is our basic building block of physiology. Um, it uses energy in the form of something called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. Um, this is formed through a process called cellular respiration, which happens in an organelle called the mitochondria. Um, does anybody else know what the nickname is for the mitochondria? Yes, yes. 
Um, this is my crowning professional achievement, this slide right here. If you ask my, my partner who is down in the artist alley, he will look and roll his eyes so hard. Um, but this is my crowning achievement right here because this is what we learned in seventh grade biology, right? The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. It goes through this magnificent chemical reaction. Those of you who had to memorize the Krebs cycles shuddered when I said magnificent. Um, but that's, that's, it is the powerhouse of the cell and it's what keeps us alive. So really, I'm saying it keeps us alive, but we're looking at our grass types. Um, something I like to call the Bulbasaur conundrum or any grass type Pokemon really. Um, once again, Bulbasaur is just, you know, a one, right? So is it symbiosis or physiology? How does he get his food? How does he make his energy? Should we be feeding him, essentially? Um, so the Pokedex, we're, we're gonna go back to the, to the base text. So a strange seed was planted on its back at birth. The plant sprouts and grows with this Pokemon. Eh, written by a 10 year old. I like the lore, but like really? Like Venusaurs are just plopping seeds on there? What's up? This one's a little bit better. Bulbasaur can be seen napping in bright sunlight. There's a seed on its back. By soaking up the sun's rays, the seed grows progressively larger. That's a lot more helpful, right? How many of you are plant parents? I am, I'm not good at it, but I am, right? Yeah, you, you pl plop them under a grow light, you give them water when you remember, or depending on your plant every day, and they do get bigger, right? And then you have to repot them. Um, Bulbasaur are the same way. So it just says that it's napping in sunlight and it grows. There's no mention of anything else going on there. So what's happening is Bulbasaur is in bright sunlight. The light is getting absorbed into the leaves and used in the photosynthesis process. So essentially, photosynthesis is taking light and building sugar. And sugar is what you need to undergo cellular respiration. So in theory, Bulbasaur is its own perfect little cycle. When it grows up, things get a little bit more complex. So Venusaur still has a butt on the Pokemon's back. To support its weight, Ivysaur's legs and trunk grow thick and strong. If it starts spending more time lying in the sunlight, it's a sign that the bud will bloom into a large flower soon. So this is fully implying that Bulbasaur sleeps in the sunlight and eventually will just turn into an Ivysaur. Those of you who have played the games know that there's, there's a little bit more involved in that, right? <laughs> uh, a couple levels involved in that. Um, but that's fully implying that eventually it's gonna have enough energy, build enough food that it turns into an Ivysaur. So essentially what happens here is that Ivysaur's leaves are bigger. It actually has leaves, right? So it's absorbing more energy using different wavelengths of sunlight. And plants do this too. If you look at a plant, plant's leaf color, it's absorbing that wavelength of light. So you'll see plants that have like purplish leaves, you'll see algae that's kind of purplish, um, you'll see bright green leaves. If you leave your succulents under bright sunlight, you're gonna get sun stress, they're gonna turn a different color, right? Um, that, that's happening here too. Um, and then eventually, I guess they sleep enough and they turn to a Venusaur. Wow, that's wild. Um, so there's a large flower on Venusaur's back. The flower is said to take on vivid colors, like I mentioned before, if it gets plenty of nutrition and sunlight. The flower's aroma soothes the emotions of people, which is just kind of nice. But eventually, you know, you're absorbing enough wavelengths of light, you're developing this energy, you've built enough sugar, you turn into a Venusaur. In theory, right? But then we have things like carnivorous plants, like feed your Bulbasaur a hamburger, please. So he does need to eat. So carnivorous plants eat because there's not enough nutrients in sunlight. Sunlight and photosynthesis only builds a sugar. It doesn't give you the phosphorus. It doesn't give you the nitrogen. It doesn't give you your vitamins, Gary. <laughs> you need other things, right? You need to have a balanced diet. So this is me proposing that, yeah, photosynthesis is great, but please feed your grass type Pokemon because they need something else to grow big and strong. Cool? All right. Now, for those of you who are thinking about food and getting hangry, <laughs> I love Marpico. He's my, he's my personal Pokemon. Um, he is the embodiment of my Crohn's disease because I'm either happy or I'm flaring. Um, but the question is here, how do we know when to eat, right? Okay, we're talking about feeding our Pokemon, but other than me talking about food and you having that like, oh yeah, I am hungry kind of thought process, like how do we know that? 
our bodies do it naturally. So there's this idea of homeostasis, and homeostasis is the idea that we want to stay at a perfectly balanced set point. And if you move from that point, our bodies are gonna move us back to that point. Similarly, if you're sick and you have a fever, right? Your body is putting up your, your body temp. What happens when you don't need it anymore? You start sweating to cool yourself down, right? That's the easiest homeostasis that I can think of. So we do this via things called hormones, and these are chemicals in our body that our body produces itself to say, hey, we need something big to happen. These are events that we can't necessarily have our brains tell us because it does need to happen over time because it would really stink if you just all of a sudden got super hangry, right? It's happened to me. But like, <laughs> once again, if you want to talk about that, you, my partner's down in the artist alley. But um, when you get hangry, you don't want that to happen all at once. It's kind of like, ooh, I could go for a snack, right? You don't immediately go to, I need to eat something now or I'm going to pass out. So hormones are these chemicals that do this process slowly. Um, Morpico actually, they cite hormones in Morpico's polka dot country, which I think once again shows the evolution from these are cute little animals that we're going to make fight and be friends with to, hey, these are animals that live in an environment and have bigger lives, right, that are more closely associated with our own world. Um, we have something called the neuroendocrine connection. So once again, you can actually think, hey, I'm hungry, right? You can have that conscious thought because there are connections there. Your brain connects with your endocrine system. Um, this is done through things like glucose. So you've heard of things like having a low blood sugar. You've heard of um, insulin, right? Insulin actually helps your body activate its ability to use sugar. Um, glucose is sugar. Um, ghrelin is really what we're talking about here. This is the hormone that's involved with Morpico. It's the hungry hormone. So when your body senses low blood sugar, your body will also produce ghrelin and say, hey, go eat something. Um, and that's when Morpico turns from happy to hangry. Um, we also see this in other uh, Pokemon types. So those who are a fan of the Ursaluna line, um, the um, Teddy Ursa line, um, it's actually in their Pokedex entry that they will hibernate. Um, so they have to eat a lot before they go to sleep. Um, Snorlax and Munchlax, I am embarrassed to say it took until I made this slide to figure out that Munchlax was eating before hibernating as Snorlax. That took a little while. <laughs> um, but that's also in their Pokedex entries. So Pokemon's thinking about that. So some other quick ways we use energy. Um, we do so in protein building. Um, this was my thesis. We like building proteins. Um, making and exporting the structural building blocks for tissues. Um, you see this in Spoink. If Spoink doesn't build those structural tissues, what happens to Spoink? Sad things. <laughs> Very sad things. Um, so we have things in real life like collagen, elastin, fibrin, and keratin. Those are your big players for your skin, your connective tissue, your tendons, your bones. Um, calcified tissue is basically just squishy tissue that incorporated minerals. Um, I know I am going surface level on that. Trust me, I do. <laughs> um, but if you want to complain at me later, we can talk about my thesis. It'll be great. Um, specialized structures. So this is also things like the ink in Smeargle's tail. Um, you never think about that as a protein, but that's really a protein. Um, using energy for cell signaling. So cells talk to each other all of the time, and that takes energy to open and close um, those ports in the cell uh, wall. And then heat. So cellular respiration is a combustion reaction. It's energy. You don't get it back. Um, there's a physics thing about that. You do not get that energy back. But heat, that's energy. It's a combustion reaction, and you're all on fire. Good work. Tiny little fires. All right. So <laughs> real quick, let's, let's talk about some, some of the, the whalemers and the whale lords in the room. So the origins of Pokemon. So there are two ways to approach this. There is um, the fossil record, so what's found in the ground. You, as a 10-year-old, can pick up a fossil, go, go to a guy, and be like, hey, man, I want a dinosaur. And they're going to say, sure thing, buddy. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a whole book about why that's a bad idea. Um, and, and a couple movies. Um, but, you know, 10-year-olds, let's give them a pterodactyl. Um, we also have the written record. So this gets closer into lore and theology. 
So things when we're talking about like Arceus, we're talking about like the Pantheon for lack of a better term. I'm not touching that. We're really looking at the written record of things like unknown. We know unknown were kind of the basis for the alphabet, um, but they're actually Pokemon too. We also have things like unchanged and surviving species. So you have Relicanth, which is just basically a coelacanth um, that you can play with. Um, we have those in real life. We no longer have mammoths, but in the Pokemon world, they still have their mammoths, um, which I think is also really cool. Also, I love Swinubs, so that's, that's really great. In real life, we have things like horseshoe crabs, and now that I am back on the East Coast, you people have definitely seen a horseshoe crab. Um, it does get a little rough. I'm like, who's seen a horseshoe crab before? Um, and no one says, yeah, yeah, yay! They're great, aren't they? So horseshoe crabs are actually super important, and this is my soapbox for the panel, surprisingly enough. So horseshoe crabs are an unchanged surviving species from millions of years ago, and they are super important for us humans because their blood is special. Um, they have a copper-based blood with a specific enzyme that will clot around anything that gets into their bloodstream. And once those clots get expelled out of the body, they no longer have that bacteria. And that's how they stay healthy. That's their immune system. That enzyme is really handy for laboratory testing. <laughs> um, so companies will fish horseshoe crabs. And they will get horseshoe crab blood, not enough to kill the animal. They take out a little bit, they throw it back. But, you know, ethics, right? Um, so talk to your representatives, understand what's going on in the Chesapeake Bay and beyond. Um, and make sure that, that there are fishing limits, that there are regulations protecting horseshoe crabs, because these enzymes really are the only test um, supported by international regulations to test things that go into our bodies. Um, if you'd like to know more about that, that's actually my day job, not the horseshoe crab thing, but quality. So if you want to talk more about that, we can talk after too. So long story short, they're super cool. Um, their tails are not stingers. They'll flip themselves over to make sure that, you know, they're not a seagull's next meal. Um, but they're super important to us too. So love your horseshoe crabs, advocate for ecological policy in your backyard. Um, and that they're in his my soapbox. <laughs> they're great. Yeah. Okay. So now we get to talk about the Waylord in the room. And uh, I'm not talking skaties. So this is a great comic from Super Effective, um, done by the person who drew VG Cats. Um, and it's uh, the Bulbasaur is evolving. Um, do, 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 Congratulations, your Bulbasaur evolved into a V, or a Bulbasaur evolved into an Ivysaur. No, it didn't. And I'm here to tell you that that old man is right. So we are gonna talk about the E word. So <laughs> traditionally, um, and in our world's textbooks, evolution is defined as descent with modification, typically passed down through generations. Um, this was most uh, famously brought to us by Charles Darwin. Um, he did have his theory of evolution um, from on the origin of species. If you've ever read The Origin of Species, you know that one time he got really mad at an iguana that stole his lunch. Um, that's a fun little like fact from the book. Um, but really what he's known for is noticing that all of these birds look the same, but their beaks were different. And depending on what island he was on, the beaks changed. They were thicker to crack nuts. They were thinner to get bugs out of rocks, things like that. Let's talk about metamorphosis real quick. So metamorphosis is a developmental transformation that turns an animal larva or juvenile stage into an adult or adult-like stage. Oh, that's weird. I wonder where I've seen that before. <laughs> so either way, when we're talking about evolution, our evolution, descent with modification, it's really adaptation, so the small behaviors or physical attributes that help you survive in your environment that get passed down to your offspring. Once again, we see this with all of these birds look really similar, but their beaks are different, right? Um, Darwin's finches did get a nod. <laughs> um, in Oricorio, I lost my mind. I think it's a little bit of a cop-out that you could just feed them nectar and they'd evolve into the next oricorio. I think you should have been able to catch each individual one, but eh, what do I know? Yeah, <laughs> region variants. I, that's close, yeah, that, that's closer. Um, but you know, they're, that's Darwin's finches in, in Pokemon. 
when we're talking about things like natural selection, natural selection is the mechanism with which evolution works. So natural selection, if you have a trait that is predisposing you to survive and make offspring, odds are it's gonna be passed down, which kind of shows you why our shinies are so rare. So if you're a purple waylord, you're not gonna find love in the ocean. You're a weird looking waylord, unfortunately. <laughs> so other waylord, what's wrong with you, man? Red Gyarados, now technically he is a genetically modified example, but once again, he's going to be predisposed to have aggressive tendencies. He's going to be predisposed to being a different color. That's also not helping. I mean, it helps us, we love him. But, you know, not so good for survival. When it comes to that pink little spiel, if you are a pink spiel, and you're on a rock with a bunch of other darker blue spheels, and a bear tick comes along and wants lunch, what are your odds? So anyway, love your shinies. Um, there's a great dorkly comic about loving shinies that involves a shiny whooper. You should go ask Andy Cluthy about it. He's down in the artist alley. Love, love them because they wouldn't survive out, out in the wild. So when we're talking about understanding evolution and mapping it, there are these things called phylogenies and they're the relationships between species. So like things like a relationship between a jaguar and a tiger, right? Um, phylogenetic trees depict evolutionary relationships. So you can actually go through and map when cats and dogs split off, right? Um, someone was amazing enough to do this as their master's thesis. Um, it back in like 2012, um, so it is oh, over 10 years old, but it's still a really cool paper that shows you how they made these relationships, how they went into the computer programming to relate all of these species together, except they did it with Pokemon. Um, and it was up until Sinnoh. So that also kind of dates it back a little bit. But they entered all this data and they mapped out a tree of how all the Pokemon are related to one another based off of Mew as the original Pokemon. So that's a big, that's a big piece of data. Um, and making these is really difficult. I mentioned that there was programming involved, there's specific software involved, and it really does take a long time. Um, so the fact that they did this for their master's thesis, it's in the credits. Um, if you want it, I can also email it to you as a PDF, because I believe in that kind of shenanigans. Um, but yes. So now that we've talked about our evolution, let's talk about this developmental transformation that turns a juvenile stage into an adult or adult-like stage. Once again, that sounds really familiar, right? Wow, wild. Um, it's Pokemon evolution. So Pokemon evolution is actually metamorphosis, right? Because we're talking about Togepi turning into all the way up to Togekiss, right? Um, Togepi cannot actually reproduce. It is a baby type Pokemon. So it actually does need to evolve to be able to reproduce, which is a more faithful representation of metamorphosis. Um, but let's, let's be honest here, the marketing department was probably like, you want us to say what? You want us to say Pikachu metamorphosed into a Raichu? Could you imagine six-year-old saying that? I mean, I think it would be funny. I probably would have done it as a six-year-old. But um, yeah, no. So uh, what's Pokemon evolution? Awesome, good. You've learned the one thing I set out to put out in this panel. All right. So as a quick recap, we learned about the fossil record, and that maybe giving a 10-year-old a pterodactyl is not a great idea. We learned about evolution, which is descent with modification, right, in our world. We learned about metamorphosis, which is actually Pokemon evolution, but you know, marketing or whatever. We talked about phylogenies, ways to map these relationships, and the phylogenetic tree. And uh, you learned all of this stuff too. And I am, I am going through real quick so I can take at least one question um, on the mic. Um, here are my citations, I don't own anything, don't, don't sue me. Um, I do not speak for my employer. Um, phylogenies, so this is the actual IEEE citation. You can find it on Google Scholar. Um, feel free to take a photo. I also have a PDF back on my main computer at home that I can email to you uh, probably like next weekend. So if you are interested in reading it, it's a hoot. Um, comics from Super Effective. Definitions are from the ninth edition of Campbell. Oh my God. Um, no. Um, here are my acknowledgments, some people that have helped me in the past. Um, sorry, Mom. Um, that QR code no longer works, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, and if you do want more of this shenanigans, I don't post on Twitter a lot. If you want my email, I can give it to you. Or I'm at Booth09 helping out my partner, so. All right, thank you.